pastel suits with t-shirts rolled up things sleeves and um and, and do you want to do you want to say that again <laughs> yeah instead of rolled up things yeah i was like what i was like oh i'm sitting here looking at it and i'm like don't read that word uh, but i did hey everyone it's elliot and todd welcome to two designers walk into a bar an ongoing conversation about pop culture and iconic design From the punkish late 70s into the plastic early 80s, the new wave movement affected design, fine art, movies, and of course, music. This season, we're unpacking how it was synthesized. Oh, I see what you did there. Yep. And how it came to have amazing effects on all things 80s and into pop culture today. So ask your favorite Top Gun cocktail slinger to whip up some B-52s, point out your Galaga high score to the other bar patrons, and join us as we pogo back into the bar. Okay, Todd, so let's talk new wave and TV. Um, in our last episode, we discussed, of course, how new wave had a distinctive look, and you were mm -hmm. all over that, mm -hmm. subject matter expert. Uh -huh. um, so it only makes sense that this look was married to a dynamic visual medium, right? Yeah. So... Yep. My guess is there's no one listening to this podcast who is unaware of MTV. Now, you may not watch it on a daily basis, but you know it's out there, right? You still hear yeah. about things like the VMAs or, or Video Music Awards, the reality TV shows that they have, and things like mm -hmm, that, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's changed a lot over the years. Yeah, it has. Uh, actually, there's a whole lot less M in that MTV. I, <laughs> I wonder if people now, when they're watching, if they really know that the M was for music television. Yeah, they think um, it's mystery. Yeah. Like, what's this all about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my TV, my television. Right, yeah, right, I right, mean, it right, has, right. You know, that, I mean, that's kind of, while I love music videos and I love that art form, that was the role of MTV was to sort of dole out pop culture, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was going to ask you when I mentioned MTV, what do you think of us being the oh, age yeah. ages we are, right? Yeah. Well, I think it was MTV is the arbiter of of current pop culture taste. Uh, it, it 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 has a a finger on the pulse of what the what the world is doing, and it um, packages it to us in in entertainment. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it helps to shape that pop culture. Other times it's sort of playing catch up to things that are yep, maybe, yep. you know, happening online or happening in other places. But it all boils down to you mentioned music. And so, Todd, when mm -hmm. I talk music and, and I say MTV, what do you think of? I mean, what is that visual medium that you think of? Um, well, I think music videos. Exactly. Exactly. I think it pushed that into an art form, actually. Okay. So let's talk about that for a few minutes here. So All right. do you know what the first video was that was played oh, on yeah. MTV? Every, yeah, yeah, yeah. Video killed the radio star by the Buggles. Right, who went on to have no uh, subsequent hits. <laughs> right, N never to be seen on MTV or anywhere else again. <laughs> so, Todd, if memory serves me correctly, when that video debuted on MTV, if I remember correctly, that song was... I think two or three years old. It wasn't like it was a new song. Right, right. It was chosen it was for the launch. Yeah, of the yeah, channel. for the yeah. title. I mean, brilliant, right? You know, I yeah. irony was lost on no one. Yeah, yeah. But um, what was the second video? Do you remember that? Like, oh, what was the no. follow up? Jeez. Um, I'm just going to take a shot in the dark given that time period. Mm -hmm. uh, and MTV at the time was extremely white, too. Yes. The, no Michael Jackson, no, no. Thriller yet. No. Nope. Um, I'm going to say, Rod Stewart, do you think I'm sexy? Ooh, I really like that guess, but uh, wrong gender. Okay. Um, uh, Donna Summer, do you think I'm sexy? 
Uh, no, actually, I said it was white, didn't I? Yeah. Bette Midler, do you think I'm sexy? <laughs> Bette Midler? <laughs> uh, tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a hint, and, and just okay. so we don't dance around this all day, if you know, okay. we'll spare the audience if uh, you don't get it. But this uh, person, if I remember correctly, this musician, she was referenced in Fast Times at Ridgemont High as being one of the looks that all of the all of the you know a lot of the female students aspired to have if i remember correctly uh was it madonna mm, close how about this okay pat benatar oh yeah really okay yeah so oh, you you better run by pat benatar you better I, run. she she gave song, us a yeah. very what early song, warning man. i think about mtv itself <laughs> <laughs> she she uh, looked ahead 40 years and said, you should avoid this. Um, but, uh, okay, so a little bit of history about MTV. As we mentioned a moment ago, sometimes it anticipates pop culture, sometimes it shapes it, sometimes it's catching up to it. But let's talk about the beginning of MTV, right? How did this thing start? Where did it come from? Because yeah. in hindsight, yeah. of course, it's very obvious, like we've talked about new wave the look of new wave you had all this interesting music why not put it on tv right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so when the station first debuted it, it was 1981 and you'll love this it only debuted in new jersey <laughs> so it only wow. debuted right outside of new york city so like northern new jersey so uh, a lot of people think OMTV oh, was this bomb that dropped, and it certainly did take off quickly, but originally it was it was pretty small. It began mm -hmm. with more of a whimper than uh, what I would say is a culture-disrupting bang, right? So mm -hmm. at least at first. Mm -hmm. This is something amazing. So as MTV was broadcasting periodically during the day, the screen would occasionally go black because the crew back <laughs> at the studio was just swapping out <laughs> video cassettes live on air. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like a video version of like an eight track when in the middle of the right. song it was switched to the other side of the eight track. You're like, oh, okay, guess this is happening now. Oh, and you can see the director off like like doing the uh, spread it out hand signs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just talk, just talk, say something. <laughs> yeah, just extend this a little bit longer. Yeah. Speaking of extending things a little bit longer, this was a channel that for good or ill, was on 24 hours a day. And this was during the time period where satellite cable was kind of coming into its own. Yeah. But the main uh, TV channels, uh, they had the Star Spangled Banner late at night, and then they yeah, had the yeah. test pattern, and that was sort of that. Um, so this was on 24 hours a day. No, what did you say? You said it started in 1981, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so, I mean, perfect year. That happens to be the year I graduated from high school and started college in the fall. And it was, I can tell you from living experience, that was smack dab in the emergence of the, the new wave scene. And that's, you know, that's what we talked about in our last episode, sort of how new wave became a scene. So seems like uh, it would probably be a good thing to have a, a whole channel that uh, was launching at the same time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You nailed it. So in our last episode, you brought up things like the political climate, yeah. introduction of new technology, working its way into music, and the DIY uh, ethos born mm -hmm. of rebelling against mainstream culture, right? Mm -hmm. So you think about the early mm -hmm. 80s, the Cold War, and, and the, you know, with this sort of predates Gordon Gecko and Wall Street a little bit. We all know where the, right. where the 80s was heading, right? So it's wild to think about a TV station aimed at young people launching during this time. But, hey, as we know, it worked. So... Who is behind all of this? That's something I've never known. I've never looked it up. Yeah, this is a, a great question to ask. It was a guy named Robert Pittman, and he's still in the game today. He's, he's an entrepreneur. He's uh, subsequently went on to, uh, among other things, he started um, iHeartMedia, I believe. So oh, okay. He's still around, still involved in shaping pop culture. But it was him and a team of about 20. And this guy at the time was 26 years old 
So he was a bit of a wonderkind, right? And he was plugged into both pop culture and business. You know, you talked about Mm -hmm. being in your late teens. He wasn't that that much older than you, but he was Mm, old enough that he could kind of have a little bit of of power and have some business chops. And we don't Mm -hmm. have time to go into his full backstory in terms of like how he got to be in this position. But long story short, he had a history in radio in the 70s. And he then produced and co-hosted a music video and news show in 1978 that ran on local TV stations in New York City. So, you know, I mentioned that MTV launched in northern New Jersey, so same part of the world, right? Right. Okay, so he convinced Warner Amex. So, as you can guess, this was a joint broadcast venture at the time between Warner Brothers and Amex, American Express. Uh, That the executives, he he talked to the executives there, and he said that young people, specifically between the ages of 12 and 34, were being overlooked by the current TV stations at the time, right? Yeah. And this was back when the big three networks dominated, right? NBC, ABC, CBS. There wasn't even Fox at this point, right? They wouldn't come along till later. So I, I sort of remember in the beginnings of MTV, there was still this real sort of DIY revolutionary approach um, to to television. It, as you said a minute ago, um, it was geared towards young people, 12 to 34, and, you know, they were not watching your mom's TV. And it was really the first liquid branding um, experience um, that I remember, and it it, it really did um, influence a lot of branding and really showed us the way. And I think everybody remembers, heck, they probably still use the astronaut holding the flag. Yep, yep. Uh, the bumpers with the space shuttle launching. I I would tune in MTV for the, for the different on-air branding spots and the bumpers um, because they were always doing cool animated stuff. And, you know... Because of that, because of the fluidity of that branding, I can start to see a bridge to uh, New Wave. Yeah, as you're talking, I'm thinking of, you know, you and I are fans of punk music and DIY, as we've talked about. And, you know, what they were almost doing with the artwork was like an animated punk flyer, right? They were finding this available art. They were then doodling on top of it. And then they were, through the use of television and animation, making it move and do fun stuff, right? So totally uh, building on the DIY stuff we had talked Mm -hmm, about in the last mm -hmm. episode, right? So back to New Wave for a minute here. There was one big challenge launching this new station, content. Yeah, yeah. So most bands at the time in the United States didn't have videos, and a lot of bands and, and record labels... You know, they might have been aware of what videos were, and there might have Mm -hmm. been these kind of very simplistic versions of that that were sort of made in the service of, like, maybe bigger shows or bigger broadcasts. But no one really invested in videos at the time because there really wasn't an outlet for them here, right? So thinking about things like the cheese that was network variety shows in the 70s, and that's really what adults considered hip, right? And networks considered to be safe. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll let that one go. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that you mentioned being in college, so you were right in the crosshairs of when all of this was happening. Yeah, and you know uh, what I can tell you from experience is, and, and we both went through design school, of course. And in the beginning, there um, you certainly are learning the foundational things of typography and. Uh, Design was print, basically. Um, And I can tell you, because of um, MTV and then uh, obviously music video as an art form, it really did change the way design school was working for me. In just my short years um, there, more people were interested in in video as as an art form and uh, were really interested in leaving print behind. This was the new thing and you could do anything with it. And it was narrative design. And that was one of the things that excited those of us that we were students at the time. And I remember, let me just a half a second, real quick story. I had a typography teacher, great typography teacher. And we were talking about MTV during one of our classes and he said i remember this quote i will remember forever he goes mtv would have ruined the beatles 
<laughs> like, yeah, well, yeah, okay, well, because he's like, it's telling you the story. It's telling you the narrative so you don't figure it out. I'm like, yeah, and it's so cool to watch it. <laughs> you know, it's funny, though, um, and, and we'll, we'll get into talking about this more in just a minute, but I don't think a lot of the videos that they were showing were literal. I mean, maybe some of them were, but I think exactly like what you're saying, I think a lot of musicians and directors yeah. and filmmakers and everybody involved in this early, I think they saw it as art projects and creative opportunities. Yeah. Well, I think to, to your point, you said before they were, they didn't have a lot of content and what they had was used for other shows like Top of the Pops and Hullabaloo and even American Bandstand, mm -hmm. they were primarily performance videos mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. they were they were cheap to make and they weren't making any money. Those videos were never meant to make any money. They were meant to keep the band fresh in front of teenagers' eyes on these other television channels. And it was the, the need for constant content and really the exploration of what MTV was doing, the programming that really exploded that art form. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, basically, it was, in a way, sort of QVC for music, right? It was... Yeah, yeah it's a perfect way to say it. Yeah. It was ads, ads for songs and, and musicians and albums interspersed with ads for other stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so MTV's programmers, right, they had to look elsewhere, like we're, we're talking about here. And so they landed yep. mainly on the United Kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as you mentioned, British bands had a trove of videos because of shows like Top of the Pops that had been running yep. for close to two decades prior to MTV launching, right? So mm -hmm. you not mm -hmm. only had new bands, but you also had new visual styles being introduced in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And this ended up leading to what was known as the second British invasion. You mentioned the Beatles, obviously the first British invasion, but there right. was the second British invasion starting in the summer of 1982. So uh, about a year after MTV launched and it lasted really until the end of the 80s, right? So mm -hmm. why? Um, long story short, like most things in this country, Todd, I know this will be a surprise to you. Uh, money talks. <laughs> what? I know. What? I know. I know. Sorry. I, I feel like the, I've, I've sort of corrupted you in a way by revealing that tidbit about our culture. <laughs> yep. You're really opening the kimono now. I'm, I, I don't know how to act. I thought you were going to say the commode. I was frightened for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> But okay, so yeah, so the, uh, MTV started making money then. Yeah, um, so by September 82? of '82, MTV was in the cultural capitals of New York. So they made their way across the river, and they were also in LA, right? So if you think about where yeah. record labels are located, where centers of cultural influence are, you know, ground zero uh, on both coasts, and the rest, as they say, is history. So yeah. There were two factors here that heavily influenced MTV's early format. So, I mean, besides like swapping video cassettes in and out at random <laughs> intervals, right? <laughs> so first, the target audience. You and I both talked about that a minute ago. Now, they wanted ages 12 to 34. And what they found out actually was that over 50% of their audience was actually 12 to 24. So even okay, younger. Yeah. And that these folks watched between 30 minutes and two hours of MTV per day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, the summer of, of 1982. I happened to uh, decided to be in summer school. So um, now, did you decide that or was that decision made for? No, 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 no. I did. Because, oh, OK. Come on, man. Summer school in the South. You had a couple hours of classes a day and then you're at the pool. But in, in the summer of 82, we would go to this guy's apartment that happened to have cable. And literally, we would watch MTV all day long. So, as you said, it was really geared towards the 12 to 22-year-olds that were watching <laughs> it. And, you know, basically the latchkey kids and the stoner college students. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was going to say, I was on the latchkey uh, side of that. You were the latchkey yeah, kid, yeah. yeah. But you, you and I had a... A, a shared uh, pastime in the summer. <laughs> Even <laughs> ten years apart, we're we're both uh, itinerant loafers. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so that was part of it, right? Was was the age? But then the second was 
Within two months of launching, MTV was already influencing local record stores in its broadcast mm -hmm. area, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. northern New Jersey and, and wherever. So how did they know this, right? There wasn't the internet. There, you know, MTV was very small. They figured this out because the local radio stations were playing completely different music from what was being asked for in local record stores. Um, okay. So yeah. kids were coming in and they were asking for bands like Men at Work or Bow Wow Wow or the Human yeah. League, right? And so yeah. if you think about this, how else could people in New York and Northern New Jersey know about these obscure bands from Australia and England? Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, it had to have a giant influence because it was it was a mixture of audio and visual together to create this presence. So talk a little bit about the visuals of the early days of MTV. So for folks who um, may not have been alive during this time and, and may want to go back and look, I mean, just go on YouTube and look for 80s MTV music videos. You can find tons of this stuff, right? Yes. And the visuals were very European, and it makes sense because that's where a lot of the bands were from. So iconic bands and their videos from this period included folks like uh, The Police, The yeah. Human League I mentioned a minute ago, Duran Duran. I mean, when I think mm -hmm. of early 80s MTV, my mind immediately goes to Duran Duran. I feel like they Yeah, they were, were sort of the first poster boys. Yeah, they, of, yeah. Of MTV. Soft Cell, Flock of Seagulls, mm. one of your favorite bands, Todd. Yes. Culture Club, Eurythmics, mm. Wham, right? So these groups all looked like models, but they actually had personality. They weren't cardboard cutouts. And they were more yeah. willing to experiment stylistically and shot their videos videos in unfamiliar places to Americans or with oddball artistic effects like Dutch tilts and early computer mm -hmm. effects, right? Mm -hmm. They had crazy mm -hmm. clothes and haircuts. They had aggressive makeup. They were androgynous. Yeah, yeah. Two videos that for me are so visually iconic from this period are both European and they both combine video and animation in completely different ways. And I think this directly speaks to... Okay, look, can I guess one of them? What, can I guess one of them for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I believe one of those videos that are visually iconic, it has to be AHA's take on me. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I would argue today, like people, yeah, as we're yeah. sitting here today, and they say, you know, if someone were to ask you, name like what you consider to be the quote-unquote best music video if the, if people don't say that right away it's definitely in the conversation i mean there right, are documentaries right. about how that video is made and even yeah. for people listening to us talking if you're like i don't know what these guys are talking about we guarantee you do <laughs> go look it up you do yeah now what, what was the second one okay in my opinion the second one was Money for Nothing by Dire Straits. Oh, yeah. So there's CGI, there's early computer animation, there's neon. You know, these guys were sort of rotoscoping over the band rotoscoping, playing on stage, yeah. right? Rotoscoping is where you take film stills mm -hmm. and then you animate over the top of it. So you're creating animation aligned with the, the visuals. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they actually mention MTV, right? How meta yeah, is that? Right. And the video has uh, MTV clips on these uh, CGI TVs. So it's it was very self-referential in a lot of ways because I remember watching this video all the time on MTV. <laughs> right, right. So it was. It was uh, the mirror was being turned back. It was Sting singing that the coda of I want my, I want my, I want my MTV, right. which the police did a promo for MTV that right. it used to be I want my MTV. And oddly enough, he was singing it to the the melody of don't stand so close to me so it was <laughs> right. like blam all these things tying together and as we talked about in one of our uh blog posts wasn't it uh, george lois the famous george lois who invented yes. the phrase i want my mtv so like all yes. of these things we got this dagwood sandwich of pop culture todd everything's just stacking on top of everything else now when i think of music video visuals i totally agree with you on those two there's another one that was a, a little later in coming but i think it it really um set mtv on fire and that would be peter gabriel's sledgehammer yes yeah, stop motion animation yeah i mean just the amount of time to make that really did just like um the aha rotoscoping video that really was that really was telling the world 
this is an art form that is not only going to affect everything that we do in a different way, but it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> whenever you say, even when I hear the song, like all the time, I don't know about you. I know we're both visual thinkers, but whenever right. I hear a song where I'm familiar with a video, I immediately yeah. see the video in my head. Yeah, that's probably why my professor said that MTV would have ruined the Beatles because they would have been trying to explain who the Eggman is and what a <laughs> right. Google Jew right, is. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, when I think of Sledgehammer, I just think of the dancing turkey. The dance, and when I say turkey, it's the food, like the prepared turkey, not right, the right, an, right. wild animal turkey. <laughs> Although, you know, drink some wild turkey and watch that video and let's see what happens. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Now, here's one more way that music and visuals influence one another, Todd. I mean, we're talking the 80s here, and we would be remiss if we did not mention movie soundtracks, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So not only do you have a new TV channel essentially running ads for your song and band, like we talked about, but now you have the additional juice from these movie clips or celebrity cameos in your videos. You have soundtrack mm -hmm. sales if you're a band, um, so it's not just about your album. It's just more exposure. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, John Hughes movies uh, are the cornerstone of this phenomenon, right? Breakfast Club, Pretty in Pink. Then we also have movies, of course, like St. Elmo's Fire. And yeah, yeah. I'm sure that for those of you familiar with these films and their soundtracks, as, as we're talking about this, the songs are jumping into your head. Yeah, yeah. And no doubt, speaking of things jumping into your head, I'm thinking about the fact that our... Our drinks. Oh, are gone? And you're going to be picking up the next round? <laughs> you know what, Todd? Like I always say, great minds think alike. <sighs> okay. All right. We'll be back shortly. Hi, we want to take a moment to mention that if you're enjoying this episode, we have an archive of topics ranging from the Olympics to movie posters. Think Ghostbusters. Iconic images. Think Bigfoot. Punk music. The Ramones. Saturday morning cartoons. The Pink Panther. And failed products like OK Soda. Visit our website at twodesignerswalkintoabar.com for full episode notes and visuals the latest blog content, and to sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on social media. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Find the links on our website or search using the phrase, two designers walk into a bar. Most importantly, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people like you find podcasts like this. And tell a friend about us. Send them a link to our podcast from your listening platform of choice. And, if you're inclined, buy our merchandise. Stickers, coasters, magnets, t-shirts. We're designers. We make good stuff, and it helps support the show. Get in touch. Use the contact form on our website, or send an email to hello at twodesignerswalkintoabar.com. We read every message we get. Honest. And we're available for speaking gigs. Email us to learn more. Okay, now, back to the bar. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Hey, Todd, thanks for the round of rum runners. Those were really delicious. Oh, well, I'm glad you enjoyed those, Elliot. That's, <laughs> that's my main concern is to make sure that you are enjoying the cocktails that I'm buying for you. <sighs> See, money well spent. <laughs> so, uh, for the first part of our episode, we talked a lot about the launch of MTV and the influence of MTV, uh, what it had on pop culture, um, how it really exploded the art form of, of video and how it married the visual and the audio together, um, creating not just new bands and new wave bands and new styles of music, but it also made uh, bands and musicians be more aware of their, their visual appeal, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know what? Between the Rum Runners and visual appeal, 
Now that we have our drinks, Todd, yeah. I want to shift gears here for just a little bit and go a tad more tropical. How about that? Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. All okay. Right. All right. Bear with me here. So we've talked about the influence and confluence of music, movies, and fashion in the stylistic marks that the 80s left on pop culture. Yep. Now, there's one TV show. We've talked about a channel. But I think there's just one TV show I feel perfectly encapsulates this moment when lightning was captured in a glorious neon lit bottle. Okay, Todd, mm -hmm. I'm not going to reveal what it is just yet. And in fact, I have an infamous two word TV show pitch that launched one of the most popular shows of the 80s running from 84 to 89. Okay, so... If I share this with you, do you think you can guess the name of the show based on the pitch? Sure. Go for it. Go All right. For it. Boy, you're confident. Here's the pitch. All right. So this is the pitch. Yeah. This was the yeah. pitch yeah. they used to yeah. do the show. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so I'm, I'm going to pitch a show to you, and you, you can tell me if you would green light it based on my pitch. Okay. All right. MTV Cops. Oh, Miami Vice, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, of course, right? Yeah, it's so iconic, right? So there had been yeah, plenty yeah. of police procedurals and detective shows before Miami Vice. But this show was a radical departure from Hill Street Blues, Magnum P.I., or other shows being made at the time. It did a right. good job of combining the grit of shows like Hill Street with a tropical setting and exotic cars of shows like Magnum. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this pitch, where did this come from? NBC Entertainment's president at the time was a guy named Brandon Tartikoff, and he was the one who sent off the famous two-word note to writer and producer Anthony Yurkovich, who, unbeknownst to Tartikoff, actually, this is uh, another Hall of Fame, Great Minds Think Alike moment, um, Yurkovich was working on an idea inspired by crime headlines and the socioeconomic environment of Miami. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So executive producer Michael Mann was the one who provided the signature look and feel, and he didn't allow colors like reds and browns to appear on camera. You know, I never thought about that, but... Uh... Brown would have killed Miami Vice, wouldn't it? Yes. Like, there's just no way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't think of that at all. Um, and Michael Mann, you know, went on to do a couple things, too. He was he's sort of uh, world-renowned for uh, for his uh, movies and, and his style. Absolutely. And apparently he was playing with color chips, like paint chips, when he sort of figured out this whole color palette idea and the oh, colors that sense. should be excluded. Yeah, it was pretty wild. Yeah. So for those of you not familiar with Miami Vice, uh, the lead characters were two cops named Sonny Crockett, who was a white Florida yep. native. Uh, he played football at University of Florida. And Ricardo Tubbs, who was a black transplant from Brooklyn. Yep. And sometimes these guys were undercover, they were mm -hmm. always stylish, and they were ready to tackle the all-too-accurate plots uh, which, to the sometimes chagrin of Miami City officials, who felt like their dirty laundry was being aired on a national stage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> their dirty laundry was set to music every yeah, week. Yeah. yeah, they were like, cool, I'm going to go there. and I'm going to go do that. Yeah, why should I freeze my ass off up north? So then the show, though, layered the new wave style we've been talking about on top of that foundation, right? The yeah, neon of South yeah. Beach, the pastels of imported designer suits, the sleekness of sports cars and cigarette boats, and all yeah. to the soundtrack of some of these bands we mentioned. Duran Duran, Devo, Dire Straits, Depeche Mode, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, yeah. and The Smiths, right? Among many, many others. And this was all bookended by Jan Hammer's synth-infused instrumentals. And those, again, were just so iconic. So iconic. You're right. The opening titles of Miami Vice, so incredibly iconic. And, you know, I always think of, like, Phil Collins. That was it. Wasn't that? He was huge. And Glenn Fry wasn't he huge on Miami Vice? Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. You're totally painting the target here. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll get to that in just a second. All right. So this show was incredibly cinematic and also incredibly hedonistic, right? <laughs> yeah. It glorified violence, sex, drugs. Hey, it was the 80s, right? That's right, right. 
So the production quality was much richer, and it wasn't flat like most TV shows at the time. I remember, in fact, reading years ago that they basically said that the creators of the show and the producers of the show said they wanted to bring a movie on the TV each week. Yeah. They wanted to make a cinematic quality show. And in their aptly titled book on television shows called TV, The Book, <laughs> <laughs> critics Alan Sepinwall and Matt Zoller Seitz describe Miami Vice as being more influenced by 1960s art house cinema from Europe than by oh. contemporary television dramas from the United States. Uh -huh. They said, quote, Miami Vice superimposed ripped from the headlines details about drug smuggling, arms dealing, and covert war onto a pastel noir dreamscape. It gave American TV its first visionary existential drama. I mean, Ooh, pastel, pastel noir dreamscape. Yeah. I read that. I love that so much. Count me in. Yeah, 100%, man. So it's hard to explain what a big deal the show was if you were born after its original run. Yeah. People Magazine ran an article about Miami Vice with another great quote, saying it was, quote, the first show to look really new and different since color TV was invented, unquote. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. wow. Uh, mm -hmm. And as we talked about a minute ago, credit Michael Mann for that. Yeah, it really was the perfect blend of, of story and music, which I think I said that earlier, as video as an art form. Yep. And it's like an hour-long MTV block um, with, with plot, with narrative. And, you know... Uh, we associate the music so much with Miami Vice because labels were lining up to get their artists on the show. Um, it certainly gave uh, records a massive bump. Yeah, and I don't think this is a coincidence. We talked a minute ago about movie soundtracks, right? And this was oh, yeah, the next course, best yeah. thing. This was the televised version of movie soundtracks. So right, right. going back to what I mentioned before the break, some of the videos for these songs actually included footage from the show huh. and uh, it became a sort of unofficial video when that song was included in a scene mm. and mm -hmm. breaking down the fourth wall a little bit often these musicians and others like miles davis and your buddy gene simmons would have oh, yeah. cameos as characters on the show and lots of actors who later became famous like bruce willis and julia roberts got their start on the show as well no kidding Huh. So, Todd, you gave a peek behind the curtain a few minutes ago when you mentioned a couple pieces of music. And the two songs I think about that immediately come to mind are when the two lead characters, Crockett and Tubbs, are driving through nocturnal illuminated Miami to In the Air Tonight from Phil Collins. Yeah, of course. And then You Belong to the City by Glenn Fry. Um, although it was actually a video for a different song, Smuggler's Blues, yeah. <laughs> that ended up landing him a cameo on the show. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, the music became so popular, you mentioned that record labels were lining up. Newspapers like USA Today would publish the songs to be featured in each week's episode. Wow. That, so it was part of a reason to tune in to see how they translated the music to video within the plot so we'll post links to both of these songs on our episode page absolutely absolutely and so there are some other long-term pop culture artifacts that the show popularized all right todd see if any of these sound familiar to you all right okay so many of the fashion styles people think of as being stereotypically 80s right the unshaven beard stubble a t-shirt under a pastel colored suit yep. no socks rolled up sleeves Boat shoes, yep. Ray-Ban sunglasses. Does that sound familiar yeah. at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the uh, dress of, if, if you were dressing fancy in the early 80s or in the mid 80s. Right, right. Yeah, ties. Not that uh, Sonny Crockett would have worn this, but, you know, a, a tie at that time was a very slim tie with piano keys on it. <laughs> <laughs> if you were scalping tickets for high school kids. Um, then the video game Grand Theft Auto. So it's set in a very Miami-like Vice City. Uh -huh. And actually, Philip Michael Thomas, the actor who played Tubbs, <laughs> voiced one of the characters in the game. And, uh, of course, Todd, naturally, one of the police officers in the game is white and the other one is black. You get the idea. So, yeah, sounds like it was a little influenced by Miami Vice, huh? Yeah, subtle homage, I guess. Yeah, right. And the idea of Miami, and specifically South Beach, as a vacation destination. So, 
going back to the early 80s, that area was a total dump. Oh, yeah, yeah. From what I understand, they didn't necessarily need to get permissions to shoot on the streets or clear out any cars because there were no cars to clear out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, these were just yeah. parts of town where nobody went. And so the show basically paid to fix up all of the Art Deco building exteriors to make them presentable so they could, you know, have this style on screen. And in addition, they pumped around a million bucks per episode into the local economy. Whoa, really? Yes. Wow. So obviously they were more than happy the the officials in miami with the headlines they objected to they were more than happy to have a million bucks in urban beautification <laughs> overcome uh any objections <laughs> they may have had right yeah uh i should say 27 million or whatever if you think about the number of episodes in a season yeah and you think about of course synthwave music that has been getting thrown up online for years and if you look at those graphics and the youtube videos my guess is they seem slightly familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they had a, a, a look of the time. I think it was, uh, as we were saying earlier, it had sort of that DIY uh, ethos. It had um, artwork running through the, the filter of what video was doing. So it was, in some cases, oddball colors and um, odd patterns that were juxtaposed to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think if uh, an alien landed from, you know, somewhere else or, or picked up our signals broadcasting from planet Earth, they would think between shows like Miami Vice and Blade Runner that it was always either dusk or just nighttime. <laughs> that the sun, right, right. sun never actually came up. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, so as we wrap up, I think one of the big takeaways here is that TV provided opportunities for all sorts of exposure to progressive new wave content. And some of that was homegrown in the United States and some of it, of course, was imported. And it was being pumped into living rooms all across America, right? So you didn't need to travel to England or New York or Miami to learn what was happening. With a click of the remote, these people were coming to you. I mentioned earlier, I was 18 when MTV started, had a major influence on me and uh, where my career was going to go. And of course, Miami Vice, same thing, but on network television. And I was in my very early 20s when all of that was happening. Uh -huh. And man, it was just right in the pop culture wheelhouse. It was, it was so mid 80s. And um, for our listeners out there, if you haven't heard our episode on Olympics graphics where we talk about the 1984 Olympics in L.A., this is a really good tie-in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The aesthetic is dead on. So you talked a little bit about the fashion of Miami Vice, and you also talked a little bit about the influence of... Uh, European bands and bands from the UK on MTV uh, they were a little bit new they were fresh they were different obviously style was really important so just to tease our next episode a little bit as we continue talking about new wave and the 1980s we're going to talk a little bit about how new wave influenced fashion and uh, and our clothing choices from that era and I think most people are probably thinking right now, oh, God, I hope they don't show pictures of me <laughs> when they talk about that. <laughs> Todd, are you going to wear your Beat It jacket when we record our next episode? I am, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my chains, and I'm going to wear belts. I'm going to wear three belts that don't connect to anything and probably five Swatch watches. Yeah, I was going to say I'm going to wear my uh, three Swatch watches, uh, unmatched Chuck Taylors, and an Ocean yeah. Pacific shirt. And, and along with my jams. Oh, that's great. Oh, uh, you know what? And we're both going to have to get asymmetrical haircuts before then, too, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. You mean my, mine, mine, I guess, will be more asymmetrical. Not because I did it by choice, but I just have a barber who's really old and he can't see that well. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of not seeing well, can you see our bartender from here? No, I can't, and it's not going to get any better because I'm slowly inching toward the door. Oh, I thought I thought that was me slowly inching towards the back of the bar. Oh, well, I <laughs> well, think I know what's happening here. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yep, I would love to stay and chat with you more, Todd, but uh, I got a thing, so I got to head out. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, it was great talking to you today about the boob tube 
and new wave and um, i look forward to us picking this back up on our next episode sounds great Thank you.